Okay, so we had quite an exciting tour of the accelerator and some of the halls today. And I think that must have motivated you to uh, do both experiments and theory and God knows what else. So, so in the labs, they do the dissection of hadrons uh, uh, practically and really, and here we will be doing only, only in theory. Uh, uh, especially, uh, I'm quite interested in what they do at Paul C, with, where they measure the uh, form factors of uh, myon and kaon, and that is one of the things that, that interests us quite a bit. So it was quite exciting to go and, and, and see how do they do the measurements. So dissecting hadrons in continuum QCD approach. Now I think I'll not be giving a lot of little examples and, and stuff, and we'll be talking about the hard stuff and and probably uh, only giving you some of the results that uh, uh, in this approach are, are calculated and uh, and I'll concentrate most of the things that we have done it or do it in, in our group one way or the other. So some of the things that you see uh, um, on the slide, you have already uh, seen them during the lecture. So, so this is here again, as always, the, the QCD Lagrangian. The covariant derivative here contains the interactions between quarks and gluons. There are self-interactions of gluons here. And looking at it, it, it really seems very harmless. Okay? Uh, but as, as we all know, that, that it, is, it is not. Okay? And, and uh, fundamentally, there are two things which make QCD very different from other uh, gauge field theories which, make, which form part of the standard model. And that is that there are a couple of phenomena, phenomena, the dynamical mass generation through chiral symmetry breaking, confinement, uh, that, that these are two of the phenomena that uh, uh, emerge non-perturbatively. That is to say that uh, you can't see them, you can't uh, easily uh, deduce them just looking at the Lagrangian or doing a perturbative expansion of these because these phenomena will not be seen in, in perturbation theory. So that's why these are called uh, emergent phenomena. Okay, So we know that quarks and gluons uh, uh, do not reach detectors. In fact, you know, in any heavy ion collisions or uh, deep and elastic scattering processes, we can, we can create lots of uh, gluons and quarks, but much before they reach the Detectors, they conspire among each other uh, to form colorless hadrons. In fact, uh, more strictly or formally speaking, uh, color singlet hadrons. So uh, uh, it's not only quarks and gluons, but any combination of quarks and gluons which would have color doesn't reach the, doesn't reach the detector. So this is, this is one thing. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and we have the formation of color singlet bound states whether they are mesons or baryons or, or other or other things which do not have color. Then we have this emergence of, of hadron, hadron masses from, from QCD dynamics. Okay. We know that uh, a Higgs mechanism is responsible for giving the quarks. Uh, I, uh, somebody was uh, talking about uh, yesterday, me only discussing up and down uh, quarks more, but you know, we talk about these more because these are the ones basically we all are made of. Our protons and neutrons are made of uh, uh, made of protons, uh, made of uh, quarks up and down. So, so, so these uh, get masses through the Higgs mechanism, which is of the order of a few MeV. Uh, and uh, and and the the QCD dynamics is is responsible. For giving out of this total proton mass about 98, 99%. So if you if you you know try to understand uh, um, um, matter at a larger scale, uh, you will realize that uh, we are odd in, in many ways. You know when when humanity started, we thought that we were the center of everything. We were the center of the universe. Uh, um, so then we realized that no, that was really not the case. Uh, then we thought at least we were center of our solar system, but then it didn't come out to be the case. It's, it's the sun, which is the center. Then, uh, then later we realized that we are not even made up of the matter, which most of the universe is made of. So if you look at the whole thing, 
I think it's the dark energy which takes most of the percentage, say, I don't know, more than 70%. That is 20% dark matter. And we are made of only 5% or 4% of, of the whole thing that we see in the universe. So if you focus only on the luminous matter, then uh, even in that luminous matter, you would see that about 98% of the mass, which is uh, true um, um, nuclei, uh, what is mostly made is of, of variance, not of not of not given by the Higgs matter. It's the QCP dynamic. So the origin of uh, confinement and dynamical mass generation could possibly be traced back to the, you know, it's a debatable thing. Uh, part of it, especially confinement, could be traced back to the green functions of quarks and gluons. And uh, uh, this is the graph that we, where we left last time. We have also seen um, the evolution of the running coupling towards infrared, and 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 that's what makes it makes it all interesting. So these emergent phenomena of QCD, which are non-existent or we cannot see in perturbation theory, are naturally linked to the infrared enhancement of the strong coupling. So we saw. A few examples, both in quantum electrodynamics and, and quantum chromodynamics, some simple models in which we see that when we go to couplings which are higher of the order of one, then uh, dynamical mass generation takes place. We did not look at the problem of confinement. That is a lot more complicated problem. And uh, I have neither worked on it so much, only a few problems, and and but that there is another problem one, one, one should look at it when, when coupling becomes large. Uh, then the effects of this uh, this pattern of dynamical mass, you know, we we do this continuum studies through Schwinger Ison equations, through the study of uh, these green functions. So so the whole scheme works like this: here. you calculate your green function, you start from a Lagrangian, you have only quarks and gluons, then you put them together, then you make mesons, and then you study whatever physical observable you have to study, like form factors or I don't know GPDs or PMDs. Uh, whatever it is, your your basic build, building blocks that enter the calculations are, are the green functions. So when we study the green functions at the at the level of schwinger dyson equations, most of these green functions you will see um, um, come out to have this particular uh, particular pattern. Like this mass function here, this is has a plateau in the beginning, and then it falls. It falls actually like a one over p square, and it is. Uh, um, uh, as a power law, but then it is, um, it has some uh, anomalous dimensions, which uh, which are of the of, of the log type. You know, it's one over p squared superimposed by by some log at the leading order at uh, at alpha. That's how it more or less falls. But then uh, um, most of these things happen in, in a very similar fashion. I was talking about the vertex. Uh, for example, what is important is the quark gluon vertex when we study the gap equation here. If you look at the quark gluon vertex, it also has about um, 12 uh, uh, form factors or structure functions, whatever you want to call them, uh, um, functions uh, uh, of this type. So, so most of them have the same structure. They're infrared enhanced, okay? especially the ones which contribute more towards the mass generation. And then they fall off some power, depending upon uh, how they are constructed, one over p square, one over p4, and there are logarithmic corrections. Then people who study gluon masses, they, they are the same thing. Run, running coupling has more or less the same kind of same count, kind of, 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 uh, of behavior. Now, when I talked about the mass generation last time, I was saying that this mass, uh, when you uh, solve the schwinger dyson equation of the quark propagator, then there are two solutions. It will remain massless, or at some point it will become massive. And many people then associate that chiral symmetry breaking is getting reflected in the equation for the quark propagator. But it's not only true for the quark propagator, it's also true for the quark gluon vertex. Quark gluon vertex has 12 structure. Interestingly, if you study those 12 structures, you will find out that six of those structures do not, do not appear if chiral symmetry is not broken dynamically. They're not there. Uh, only six of them appear, and all other six appear uh, only when, when uh, in massless case, if, if chiral symmetry is, is dynamically broken. So, so effects of chiral symmetry breaking can occur in different, different green functions. 
But then uh, what we will find interesting is that this kind of behavior in which this function is uh, has a particular form and then it goes down uh, for larger momenta and then acquires a certain perturbative behavior in the tail is something that will that gets reflected in the form factors of of uh, of mesons as well as baryons and baryons it appears as a much more complicated manner but 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 imagine for an example that i'm not going to discuss in in this but imagine if you have just a constant man that we studied in the contact interaction so if there will be a a, a contact interaction then we will have a constant alpha there is a constant alpha we saw that there is a constant mass it doesn't depend upon p square and if we calculate the pi and form factor of a large q square it doesn't fall as one over q square it becomes a constant as well so whatever is happening here eventually feeds into physical observable they themselves these quantities are not physical observable but when they enter into the physical observables their behavior somehow feeds into that so um, talking about Schwinger Dyson equations or the history of this, you'll see that um, one of the very first studies were carried out by the founder of, of uh, uh, um, uh, the standard model of particle physics, Abdul Salam, uh, along with his uh, student, Robert Dilbergo. Okay. They carried out this study in, in 1960s. There were uh, two or three pap papers written among them and they, uh, they, this is uh, the schwinger dyson equation for the electron propagator, and this is for the photon propagator. And they use a technique called gauge technique. Many people do not use it now. You, you write the propagator and vertices in terms of what are called spectral densities, uh, and then you try to find solution for those spectral densities, and that's what they try to do by solving, solving these. Okay, I've never had the chance of uh, no, not even meeting Abdul Salam, but I had the chance eventually to meet Robert Delbergo and fortunately work with him on Schwinger Dyson equations on a couple of a couple of articles. So they did this work, then Salam stopped working on it, and Robert Delbergo kept working on it and studied also the problem of uh, Schwinger Dyson equations, even in standard model, but but never did for, for QCD. Uh, then uh, some of the examples that I took for quantum electrodynamics, non-perturbative quantum electrodynamics was, was done by a group of, of Vladimir Miransky, who now works in, in, in Canada. And, and he is the one who first found out the solutions beyond a certain critical value of alpha in quantum electrodynamics. And then there is a lot of work generated by, by him and his group uh, studying those problems in the presence of an external magnetic field. You see, the problem of quantum electrodynamics was a bit hypothetical that we don't have large alpha, so you don't see what is happening there. But when you put a background a magnetic field, especially what you see is that it doesn't matter how small or big that magnetic field is, you're able to generate uh, a, an electron mass in the presence of that field, and that's called what is called magnetic catalysis. Then he actually also went on uh, to study, did some initial studies of DCSP for non-abelian gauge theories, uh, um, but only a few, uh, only one or two papers, I think, in, in some simple approximation, and saw some mass relationship between the mesons. Uh, then uh, uh, in, I think, in late 1990s, it was the work by, by, by Peter Tandy from uh, Kent State University and his postdoc, Peter Maris, who had come from Germany, and, and, and they uh, did it a bit more seriously in which they looked for the truncations of Schwinger Dyson equations, which will take into account the one loop behavior of the gluon propagator and take into account renormalization and and and, and more or less the studies were, were taken off a bit more seriously after, after those works. Okay. So in fact, those were the works, uh, they, they gave a model which was called the maris tandy model in which they truncate the product of this gluon propagator and the quark gluon vertex in a manner which uh, reproduces your coupling and the gluon propagator at the one loop level. And, and, uh, and, and from there on, you can work on the improvement of these truncations. And of course, there are uh, some better models coming afterwards, but, but more or less uh, the study of the pion and kion remains almost, almost identical. So when you use that, then this is uh, using, uh, roughly speaking, the model proposed by but them that, that we do to study this mass generation. And then I was saying that um, 
Then you have, uh, if you are studying pion, then you have to study the bound state, okay? Um, it, it's very, very similar to what we do is it, the relative momentum of quarks is K, the P is the total pion momentum. Then uh, this, this, what, this is what represents uh, the bound state problem. And, and you have the pion and this is the, the same quark propagated and the kernel here, it means all types of interactions which can take place, these two quarks. And these two uh, are not completely arbitrary from what happens in the gap equation. In fact, they are awarded entities which make a connection between these two. And the entities which appear in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the quark uh, um, um, gap equation or quark propagator should be related to the amplitudes which are appearing here. Uh, according to what are called the Goldberger Treeman relationships in, 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 in infrared CD. So you have to make sure that all of this is obeyed at all, all levels. Now, I um, um, yesterday when we studied, we only looked at these two functions. These functions are important because this is dominant in infrared and this more or less controls the perturbative behavior at large P square. Along with G, H doesn't uh, contribute so much in almost any of the studies. And one of my Mexican students say it doesn't contribute because H is not pronounced in Spanish. Okay. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter if it is there or not. Uh, so here we have, uh, um, so this mass function drawn slightly differently, I think, uh, the, the different scales, not the logarithmic scale. And uh, what I wanted to mention was that this EF, GH function, they more or less, you see, if you, you know, these uh, quark propagator, which we calculate here, enters here in this equation for this, uh, this these amplitudes. And these amplitudes have something, some some relationship that is similar. So this in, in, in quantitatively is very small, H is even uh, uh, much smaller than that. This E is dominant in the infrared. So what happens in the infrared QCD feeds into this function. And not in this f function, when you go to large Q square, although it is not visible here, it is in fact you will see that the product of E and F will be controlling the large Q square behavior of the form factor. Okay. When studying the elastic form factor, it is the photon which probes the dressing quark inside the bound states, highlighting the importance of quark photon vertex. And we have already seen this, so we don't have to uh, look at it in, in the detail. Okay, so there is a part in which when we calculate the form factor. Uh, uh, we'll see that this photon is the one which is um, probing uh, probing this. This is what is happening in 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 uh, uh, in, in, in whole C D these these measurements. Okay. So what happens is that depending upon this Q, this Q is actually related to this Q. This Q square is basically this Q square, and uh, uh, so this proton goes to a neutron pion, comes out, and this Q square. Uh, probes this pion, and we look at the events in which pion remains unbroken, and you see how it, this form factor changes as a function of Q square. Unfortunately, I took a different route to do this lecture. There's another route sometimes I take, and that is starting from the uh, definition of what form factors are and how people were calculating the nuclei form factor and how the uh, uh, Fourier transform of those are related to that, you know, the charge density and 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 the charge radius of, of these mesons and variants. I didn't have the chance to do that this time, but uh, so that's what it is telling us more or less the, the, the charge density. Uh, okay, um, so here, and in fact, uh, I, I will, before looking at the, form, uh, at the electromagnetic form factor, which is measured here, I would uh, also uh, just go uh, show a couple of uh, uh, transparencies in which uh, people also call, uh, calculate or and, and measure what are called the transition form factor of pion. Actually, one of the persons uh, who is here works for Bell. Um, Bell and Baba do these kinds of measurement in which they have the electron proton, uh, sorry, electron positron colliders. So in those, what happens is that uh, uh, the one emits a photon, another one emits a photon, and that goes to a neutral pion. Okay, and and one of the things that interested me and when we came into this, especially in this field of QCD uh, unequivocally in, in, in late 2008 or nine, were the first experimental results from uh, Babar, which, uh, which came and which seemed to contradict with a large P-square behavior was not in agreement was with the asymptotic or perturbative QCD results. So everybody was getting worried about what was happening. Okay? That was when one of my students starting a PhD thesis 
And that's when we started working, started uh, initial first study on the contact interaction model, because even um, I think uh, there was some uh, um, work by, by Radhiushkin and statements saying that the behavior of Baba was saying as if for large piece to, we are not getting QCD results. And it apparently is something like a contact interaction result, which seems to be more or less following what was experimentally being observed. So we uh, tried to do that and see how the pattern of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking dictates the Q-square evolution of the transition form factor. Okay, Experiment at asymptotic QCD for largest Q-square can provide verifications of that. So if we uh, are able to solve the quark propagator, the mass function, and if we have the, the pion amplitude computed from those calculations, and then we have an appropriate photon quark vertex, we can put these things to do the calculus. So some, one of the interesting things, uh, this diagram is it's a bit cartoon-like diagram. These are not the results. Uh, two of these lines are more or less the results of the calculation, but other lines are not. But I just want to describe what the, what the idea is. So if you, if you calculate the uh, um, um, uh, transition form factor, uh, the results of uh, several experiments lie, lie here. Okay? And the results of, of, of uh, Bell measurements of which started in actually 2010, uh, started giving the trend as if uh, uh, you come here and then, then you, you keep going up. Yeah. Uh, but the result, which was from asymptotic QCD calculated by uh, Brodsky and Lepard several decades ago, uh, is, is this result, which is this, this dashed line. Here. Okay. So it started going up and people thought, oh, it's more like, like contact interaction going high up and not coming like, because it, 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 what is drawn here is Q stripe F of Q square. So if it becomes a straight line, it means uh, uh, you know it's a it's a different kind of behavior for F of Q square than than what you would find from asymptotic uh, QCD. Okay. If it becomes a, a, a more or less like a, a as as if it's a constant F of Q square for large Q square, because only then Q square times Q square this will become a straight line, and it will not it's not dropping as one of Q square. And that is what, what we find in contact interaction. So we developed this contact interaction model. It's like uh, uh, having the mass function with different powers. And if it is one over P square power alpha, and if alpha is zero, it's like an interaction model. When you find in our calculus that results, you get it something of this sort. And that, of course, even very far much related to, it's not very, it's very far from this. But if you have a one over P square behavior in your mass function, superimposed by logs, then here also you get the same kind of behavior and, and, and uh, roughly your graph goes like this. Okay. And if you have powers in between of your mass function, then somehow it uh, interpolates these powers between uh, the constant mass and one over P square. So, uh, uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's what was there. So this was uh, some of the initial calculations, which was done with contact interaction and the one over Q square one was the extrapolation of earlier results, not a complete calculation. But then uh, there was another student we had who is now working in, in, in Spain. He did uh, a detailed calculation with uh, uh, as close to QCD, you can have uh, uh, the symmetries truncating your schwinger dyson equations and compute your uh, uh, transition form factor and, and the results that we get is this, this, this black line. Okay. And this dashed line is if you're not really considering, if you're doing the same calculation, but you're not evolving your beta salpit, sorry, your uh, uh, distribution amplitude of the pion according to ERBL evolution, evolution equation. So it's a bit higher, but if you, if you realize that ERBL evolution equations also evolve your PDA, then you get this black curve. And, and that was, of course, uh, not in, 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 in so much agreement with this Baba. But then the, the results of Bell experiment came afterwards, and those are those, uh, those, those green ones. And, 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 and they seem to be, when they fix it, they fix it with a result which is more akin to what whatever QCD tells us. So we thought, OK, you know, that seems to be, seems to be a good sign. But the thing is that if you're uh, using whatever uh, um, way of calculating is it's not to calculate one observable with this. You know, you have to produce a multitude of observables, and if everything comes out okay, then you can start seeing that okay, this is this is this is not uh, uh, something you're developing one what one particular thing. 
So that uh, from there, you can also uh, uh, compute here the, the uh, ion distribution uh, amplitude. And, and you see that this is the asymptotic result, which was predicted by Brodsky and, and Lepage. But if you do this uh, uh, calculation of this, it's about 2 GeV, where sometimes Lattice can do it as well, then, then it's a lot more flat. But when you try to uh, do the evolution of this according to the EBR, EBRBL evolution equation, then you see that it, it keeps going towards asymptotic results the higher you go in, in Q square, but you have to go to very large Q square to obtain that. So it satisfies uh, uh, the results that we calculated, satisfies the abelian anomaly at, at Q square going to zero, and it agrees with the prediction of asymptotic QCD as well, and agrees well with experiment from low to intermediate range of momenta and favors more the Bell results and not so much the Bar Bar results. And the distribution amplitude is broad and concave at the hadronic scale. And, uh, uh, and uh, in fact, at, uh, at that point in uh, a couple of years later, the results which were available from Lattice, they are not of direct evolution, direct calculation of PDA at that point, only the first moment of PDA was known. And if you try to construct the PDA using only the information of one uh, moment and afterwards two, you find that this yellow band, I don't know if you can see is that that is somehow comes out to be this. So it came out to be not so different from what the predictions were there for this uh, continuum QCD. Isn't that by the one moment? It's uh, when, when your Q score is so large that then all other, you know, there is no other mass scale around okay. So then uh, the same input you can also use to do, uh, so I'm talking about that the work that we started was more on the transition form factor of the pion going to two photon, but you can of course calculate the pion uh, electromagnetic form factor to the diagrams that I was showing yesterday. I think I have not shown them here. And uh, when we do this calculation of, uh, of the, of, of the um, uh, pion um, beta salpeter amplitude, and then you put them into the form factor. There are two or three different groups. They do it a bit uh, a bit differently. Okay, some do some direct calculation, some do in one approximation is called the rainbow ladder approximation, and one do beyond the rainbow ladder approximation. Uh, but fortunately, uh, my student was working with one scheme, and then I got a postdoc from the other group and said, let's put together and see if all of us use different degrees, do we get some similar results or not? So uh, there was the rainbow ladder direct calculation done, then was beyond rainbow ladder. And there is another uh, type of calculation which allow us to go a bit, bit far. The thing is that direct evaluation of basis salpeter amplitude for large P square is absolutely difficult. You hardly can go beyond really about four GV squared. So one of the techniques people use is that you compute your solution and then you do a, do a fitting with what is called uh, this perturbation theory integral representation, which was given by some Japanese people some, some time ago. Uh, and, 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 and you fit that with perturbation theory integral representation, and then you extrapolate the results to large Q squared, and that allows you to go to much higher values. So there is only a, a band shown for, for one of these results because if you show the band for all others, they're all superimposing and it it's becomes a bit confusing. So what I just want to tell the message is that it doesn't matter which technique you use, you have the very uh, results which are close to other. And all this, of course, uh, uh, this is the same graph that I was showing of the PDA. This is nothing new. Then later on, there were some lattice calculation uh, of direct calculations of PDAs and not through, uh, uh, I think they constructed moments and from there they themselves constructed and try to reduce the pi on mass uh, uh, to the value uh, which we know. And what we see that we, when we go closer and closer to the pi on mass and lattice calculation, then it uh, from a steeper uh, a distribution, it becomes a bit more flat as the one that, that is also obtained using continuum finger method. So it all, seems to be coming uh, in, uh, in the same, same, same picture. We can do for the K-on as well. Uh, uh, you, you can see that even yesterday's uh, constant, constant mass approximation is also passing through these data. It doesn't really, you know, the data is so bad and in so Q square region so, so little that uh, anything basically will pass from there. So it doesn't say much. But of course, this thing, uh, um, our 
gap uh, our this is, is 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 the results of the calculation it has nothing to do with the errors which are here only now the 12 gev upgrade has taken the data uh, for for this uh, for this kaon actually i think uh, up to 5 gev squared and and i will show them and 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 the analysis that a pre preliminary analysis is already being being uh, is already is already there no? So you can do that, and then you have the PDA for the Kon as well. It was the work done by a, a group in Spain called K. Segovia, along with, with Craig Roberts. Uh, uh, so the results obtained from Schinger Dyson equations appear at least uh, under different calculational schemes within the same formalism seem to be uh, uh, seem to be robust. Now, one of the things that uh, one can do, and, and and we did, and we tried to use this is uh, is uh, is probing the standard model we know that uh, um meon with a uh, uh, finesse has this uh, this magnetic moments e over 2m and this factor g is what comes out of the dirac equation for charged elementary fermions with spin off having g equal to 2 <clears throat> and the anomalous magnetic moment is of course the deviation of, of this magnetic moment from the value g equal to two, and it is generally defined as g minus two divided by two. And, uh, and of course, it appears due to radiative corrections and renormalization of quantum electrodynamics was established in 1943 by Tomonaga's work, and then later on rediscovered by 47 and 48 by Schwinger and, and Feynman. And Schwinger was the first one to do the calculation of this one loop, loop order in quantum electrodynamics. And, and this value was found out to be alpha over two pi. And if I'm not wrong, this number is written also on his grade. Okay, mm -hmm. it's written Schwinger's even alpha over two pi. Uh, uh, one can see that the amplitude of muon scattering of an external electromagnetic field can be written as such, and you can then write this uh, in on the on shell limit in the most general form as uh, uh, as the sum of these two terms one is uh, what is associated with the dirac uh, form factor uh, uh, if this term is zero then you have exactly g equal to two result and 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 this is what is associated with what we call the the sorry the pauli form factor because pauli already knew about uh, 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 about this g equal to two and and that came from the extension of uh, the work that was done by schrodinger in quantum mechanics he introduced to understand the stern gerlach experiment, Pauli had added a term with two spinners containing electron in the presence of a magnetic field, and he knew that this should be equal to two. So, so sorry, this, this, uh, this is what is related to the, uh, to the, to the magnetic moment, this term, and, and because Pauli knew about it already, this is a, what we call the Pauli form factor, and this is what we call the Dirac form factor. So any, 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 um, um, Correction which comes here contributes to this G minus two. And of course, the dominant contributions come from quantum electrodynamics. Then the second dominant con contributions come from the vacuum polarization diagram of uh, including hadrons, then the weak interactions. And then there are other terms like this, which, uh, which uh, in a way probe what is seen uh, in the experiments, uh, seen pions, their electromagnetic form factor. Or, or 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 the chaos. For example, at at uh, at at this level of approximations, when we have uh, two loops, we have this transition form factor pi zero going to gamma star gamma should be extended to pi zero going to gamma star gamma star, and this is what enters uh, as hadronic contribution because uh, 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 these two photons can get together to make a pi zero, and this pi zero, as we know, can go back to two photons. And therefore, this diagram also has these effects coming in. In fact, not only pi zero, but other pseudo-scalar masons can be there. And then there is this box-like diagram. In fact, here it's more like a circle-like diagram in which you can have the charged pions or the charged kaons uh, running around. And that is more like saying that, you know, it's a photon probing a pi plus, and that is what the form factor of our uh, form factor calculation what, what gives you. So if you can extend this calculation that we did for pi zero going to gamma star gamma to pi zero going to both of the photons being off shell, uh, uh, then it, our calculation extends something like that. It's symmetric in both sides and, and obeys uh, uh, the relationship uh, uh, conformal limit of QCD correctly. 
And from there, we can actually compute the contribution which comes from the pi zero or the eta or the eta prime or the eta c or eta b and collect together all pseudo scalar uh, pole terms and, and you are able to compute this number. And, and it, it actually comes out to be almost, well, of, of the same ballpark where some dispersive method of letter results give us the results. In fact, one of the new contribution was this, uh, was calculating it also seeing how much eta C and eta B contribute. In fact, we realized that eta B contribution is much smaller, would uh, not be uh, you know, available to experiment for a long time, but the eta C contribution was after a lot, not so, so small as compared to it, but still it's uh, an order of magnitude, an order of magnitude large. Okay. So that, uh, so what I'm saying is our studies of the mesons are a lot more robust, which we understand uh, the details of it, and we can even do some precise, precise calculations. So these were coming from the transition form factor, but similarly, what we can do is also these box calculation. These, uh, this is where these uh, form factors, electromagnetic form factors of pion and kion enter, and they will be running around here. And then you have certain parameterizations giving according to which you uh, uh, have this result. Here, in, interestingly, we don't have to go very large values of, of Q squared uh, to get the dominant results coming, coming which contributes to the G minus two. Uh, um, you see, what will be important for QCD, it will be to be able to see Q squared quite large, but the part of this calculation which contributes to the G minus two of the muon, it's only sufficient to go up to about four G V squared for pions and a bit, bit more, bit more. So this is the work that we did. It was published last year, and we we, we computed this, and, uh, and 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 the contribution we have uh, is is uh, is this coming from the uh, pion box and coming from the from the from the K one box, and these are the results that we can compare with dispersive method. One of the things which so far has not been uh, calculated, and we can do it in our calculation, is is uh, Having in mind that the excited states of pion and kion, the radial excitations can also contribute to these uh, G minus two, and and there are no results in the literature so far, and we we are uh, uh, we are doing it. Uh, in fact, so I think I, I I what did I do? I think these preliminary results are the for the radial excitations of uh, yes of of pi one and k one, which are the radial excitations of pi one and k one. And this is the results for that. This is for the dispersive method. Sorry, yeah. This is our results for the pi one and k one, and these are the results from the dispersive methods. Uh, so this is what was uh, was was published here. But now recently we have uh, done this calculation. We have the preliminary results, but we haven't published it yet. Uh, so that's why my postdoc keeps writing to me and I said, give me this week and afterwards, I'll have some more free time to work on that. So we have these preliminary results on the radial excitations coming from pi one and K1. You can see that it is, of course, a couple of magnitudes smaller than the results that we have for, for pi one and K1. Okay, so these, uh, uh, these studies, uh, of course, are, are, are done in, 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 in many places, what has been interested and interesting and people have been quite excited about is to be able to do this form factor calculations from low Q square to large Q square. When you ask me about the conformal limit, this is the limit where we know the results coming from perturbative or really what is called asymptotic QCD. That this Q square scale is much larger than any other scale that, that appears. And as you see that experimental results is, is available up till here. And the asymptotic result tells me that this will be the result when you are somewhere here. Okay, to say that where the experiment tells us we don't know uh, theoretically, and where theory can see the experiment doesn't tell much. So the exciting times are, are coming there ahead of us because the theoretical calculations can now uh, try to uh, have this measurement for different values of Q squared, and also the physical measurements in in uh, in Jefferson lab, which will be go to up till about eight GV squared and that 12 GV after it, and, uh, and eventually also in EIC. When there was this 2015 long range plan of nuclear science written, you know, it's, it says that the study of the pion factor is one of the flagship goals of the JLab 12 GV upgrade 
regime in which the phenomenology of QCD begins a transition from large to short distance scale behavior. This is what I've taken the statement from this long range plan. So that's uh, quite interesting. We uh, know that the pion form factor can potentially be measured till Q square six to eight GV in 12 GV upgrade of JLab. And I was mentioning that uh, uh, um, there are uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this is here, you can see the, the projected, uh, projected results that uh, you will have uh, of, uh, of, of, of JLab and two experiments. And it will be going up till up till about eight GV squared. Okay, so that's that's good. Um, then uh, with a potential and desirable next twenty two GV upgrade of the J Lab, which is also possible, and soon they're going to be a white paper out in a week's time, uh, making a case for the twenty two GV upgrade and how important it is uh, it is going to be. And, and, and there, uh, the target for the pion electromagnetic form factor would be to measure it up to 15 GV squared. So it'll cover, then eventually we'll be covering the range from zero to 15 GV squared. And hopefully we'll be looking at non-perturbative QCD and also when it is trying to make a, you know, it is making a transition to the perturbative QCD and see uh, if uh, there are models or theoretical explanation consistently um, describing what we see in the experiment. So both experiment and theory looking at the same range and that's what it is what is very exciting. I think there will be initial runs which will give you these values and then there will be uh, uh, later runs which will be giving you more and more precision of, of, of these of these measurements. And that white paper came out of uh, of the meeting that took place in January here in in, in, in JLA. Then of course, pyre and key and form factors at larger Q square will also be measured at EIC. Uh, if you uh, look at the yellow reports, there are I think three volumes, but I didn't have space to put in, in, in this slide. So one of the science question which, which says in these reports is can we get quantitative guidance on the emergent pion mass mechanism? And the key measurement is the pion form factor data that will be obtained there from 10 to 14 GV squared. And then how much interference is between emergent and Higgs mass mechanism? And the key measurement will be in pion form, K on form factor. It will be also available from 10 to 20 GV square. And I think these are the, uh, are, are the, are the projected values up to where you can have the EIC result. And this is uh, where the JLab uh, 12, 22 GV upgrade can, can go. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay, then I will be talking about where I have really not worked much. I've just only initially started it. So uh, it is good that if I go through it faster. Um, so you see that um, now people talk about this uh, three-dimensional image that you can have of, of, of hadrons. Uh, if you are, um, if you are uh, uh, along this R axis, I, I told you that if you have elastic form factors in, in some way, the Fourier transform of the electromagnetic form factor tell you the, uh, uh, the distribution of charge inside the hadron. And then you have the other axis, which is uh, where you have the, um, the distribution of quarks and what is, what is the momentum fraction a quark will be carrying of, of, the, of, of the total total hadron that gives you information of the pattern distribution. And then, uh, you know, you can put them together and what's called the generalized pattern distribution. And here, if you have this uh, skew parameter equal to zero, it will give you, for example, a combined picture of, uh, of uh, going along both these, both these axes. Okay. Now, this is, this is a slide, I think, that for, for those people who would who, who, who do really uh, uh, practice um, uh, Schwinger Eisen equation method, it's important to understand this is, is the following. That you see, we, uh, I told you very, gave you a very simple example when we were doing the calculations. There are some systems which we can study very sophisticated, it means something where we can go very close to what QCD predictions would have done if we would have ideally solved the whole QCD. Uh, that is where we have more confident con con confidence, and th those are mostly the pseudo-scalar mesons or the vector mesons. 
Uh, there we have a, a lot of sophisticated truncations. I've showed you some of the results that the results are very robust if you're serving pion and kion, and we can do uh, precision uh, calculations and compete with almost uh, all other uh, uh, methods that provide the results, whether it is lattice or dispersive method or whatever else. Yeah. These are numerically very demanding calculations. Uh, uh, just giving you an idea because you know your students, you probably would like to know how it works. I had a master's student who, who spent uh, his time of one year of research and master's. He was the first one who did this pion transition form factor. So uh, he finished his thesis and PhD, he continued. For the two and a half years passed, not even one single calculation completed. And, and it, he was very upset with me that, look, this is not going anywhere. This is taking ages. This is so much uh, computation needed that, uh, so he had, at some point said, no, I'm, 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 I'm done with it. I don't want to continue with it. But eventually he finished. And and uh, and it it was very demanding. So he was the one who did pi on eta, eta prime, eta c, eta b, and and also afterwards computed their contribution to the g minus two of the of the magnetic moment. But then he said that I can't continue the same thing. But for vector particles, that this is too much work. Find another PhD student. So you're most welcome if any of you want to come and destroy your three or four years of your life doing this. I'm very happy to collaborate with you. On, on, on those things. So those we can do some sophisticated truncations and we can study green functions quite accurately, mesons, especially their static properties. I have written baryon static properties in a, in a different color. There are some initial works, but still we have to check how much robust their results are not, but they're at you know, very, very initial stages. What we can do quite, uh, quite precisely are, are, are these things, okay? Then there is another extreme, which I can solve it here on the board in, in half an hour. Okay? This is the contact interaction model, and you can calculate basically anything you want. With it, okay? but, uh, but one thing what we have found out is that if we have a difficult system to work on, like a baryon or an excited state of baryon, and we have no clue how we're we going to work with, it's always good to work with a simple model first to be able to understand the internal structure of it if there are dye quarks uh, formation, which kind of dye quarks there are, because you can solve it quickly, you can understand which proportions contribute to which baryon more and which excited state have less, and what is the reason, what is the spin of those dye quarks, which are the masses of those. So an initial calculation into a system, which is complicated and you don't understand very much, this provides you like an insight into what for then doing the next steps. What we have found out, uh, 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 and, and here you can calculate, of course, most observed work. We have done, in fact, one calculation of a transition form factor of a nucleon going to its parity partner. I was saying that the parity partners are quite important for chiral symmetry breaking studies, but that took us quite a long time, even within a contact interaction. It was, I wouldn't tell you the number of years it took us to compare it, but it's there. And, and I think that uh, we, we are now in a position to do better calculations of these things for the future measurements, which will be done in Hall B in, in, in Jefferson Lab. In fact, one of my PhD students is devoting full time to these transition form factors. But then we have found out some other way, which is intermediate between the two. You see, when you study uh, some model in complete detail, you understand more or less the dynamics, more or less the power laws which go there, what are the anomalous dimensions for two quark systems, uh, and whatnot, and, and this gives you the simplicity of it. So you know where the aspects of simplicity come from. So what we try to see is, can we build some models uh, which will keep the good features of QCD, but not do so much on the simplicity of what is there in the contact interaction model? Okay. Can we do that part? And that's what with a student who had spent some good time in this PhD now works on these models. He says it's, it's much faster, much quicker. I get my papers out quicker and they're not so different from the results that I expect. But, but in fact, one of the open problems which we really want to study in the full QCD dynamics or as close to it as possible are the vector mesons. Because once we study the vector mesons, we already know the pseudo-scalar mesons, then the axial vector and the scalar mesons will be easier to study and whose corresponding dye quarks contribute to that. So anybody who's interested in studying vector mesons, 
please contact me. Okay, so so with this model, you can of course uh, one of the things you can do is that you can study this uh, light front wave functions. From there, you can calculate the GPDs and the TMDs and the PDFs and certain limits of these. If you have the light from wave function available, you can also go back and calculate the form. Now, I uh, um, I, I won't be able to do uh, tell you a lot of how how this is. This is just one work that we completed. So um, so we were working on these uh, these uh, you know in some of the problems we are working using these algebraic models and uh, and uh, uh, I you know I have one of my collaborators Jorge Segovia who is in Spain, who is probably the one of the only ones who can do this uh, um, full mass function calculation for, for nucleon uh, to study their, their form factor. And I suggested to him, let's start already, you know, come help me, you can do it, this, this numerical calculation. And he uses always this term, tranquilo, no? tranquilo. He said, no, 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 we can't do it yet. Just <laughs> wait, <laughs> let us do it in the simpler, simpler study. So, um, Okay, uh, you know, it's just it's just us sitting here. So, can, uh, so we have this uh, th this quark propagator, and this quark propagator is like the way we have in contact interaction model. It's 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 uh, it's, um, it's a constant mass. It doesn't run with momentum. Okay, in this particular model, that. But for this beta saltpeter amplitude, we can make a model. Remember. When we do, for example, this uh, um, um, calculations of, uh, of, of of the amplitude and the form factors, when when, it, when we calculate the form factors, you can see that, uh, for example, there is one beta cell Peter amplitude. There are two or three propagators, and then there is a quark photon vertex. So what appears in 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 the computation is is not individual things. Is a product of those two or three things which appear in the in, in, in the integration than, than what we do it. But what we know is that the calculation does become simplified if what you lose out here in the propagator, you put inside the beta saltpeter amplitude. Here, you're not solving beta saltpeter amplitude, it's an answer from the beta saltpeter amplitude because we know what the solutions are. So the complications or the P square uh, evolution that we lose out here, we insert it in this model that we use for the beta saltpeter amplitude. So we know that eventually this should work out directly for the for the mesons that we are studying at least all the pseudo scalar mesons. And we thought, let's see if this model works or not. This was actually one of my my PhD students who's now doing a postdoc and actually is not having any job for the last few months. But he's going to Spain uh, hopefully soon. So he, in fact, developed this this model. There were people. It's not that we first were the ones who developed this model. There have been other models in the field in which I was telling you when Salam and Dilbergo started using it, they use what is called the spectral representation of, of this quantity. So you have a spectral uh, representation uh, of your beta saltpeter amplitude. Remember, I told you there are four amplitudes. Here we use just one single amplitude, hoping that. This will be enough, this combination of this propagated and this to get resolved. But again, this is our first step to do it, and we will you know, complicate life uh, as, as, as time goes by. So we, you have this uh, certain uh, 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 density, and for this, you have to construct a model, and then you have a delta, which comes here with a power nu. You wouldn't know here what this power nu is for. Uh, this nu should be equal to 1 for the correct the large uh, conformal theory limits. But if you have slightly different value of mu from one, it takes into account the anomalous dimensions which come here in your mass function. So you have to be able to know what it should be uh, uh, and how many mass functions are there. So how to use the value of mu. Don't, I can't go into the details of this, but if you trust me, just trust me that it's like that. And then uh, we have this, uh, this uh, uh, lambda coming here. It is also, uh, 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 this delta is a, is a is as a function of lambda, and this lambda depends upon this uh, the, this variable uh, w in 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 a function which is quadratically uh, which has uh, quadratic uh, up to quadratic terms. People have developed models with this constant term here, just this, 
but we have uh, something which uh, which goes linearly with omega and quadratically with omega and we realized that we needed it one of this is when it becomes uh, 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 omega is is uh, uh, omega and minus omega become you can differentiate them and those are necessary to study mesons which have different quark masses it's, it's one is a u one is a different mass and the other is a different mass otherwise you, you can't do that and and uh, and and uh, uh, then you uh, have up to go to omega squared, uh, which will gives you a better handle of uh, explaining all the observables at the same time. You can't go higher than that because then you make your model so complex that you gain, you cannot do it uh, uh, easily. Okay? But this is the most complexity you can introduce and you can go ahead and you can, uh, because beta salpeter amplitude you, all, all, you give as an ansatz, you can calculate what is called the beta salpeter wave function in which you just put your uh, fermion legs uh, on the sides. And from there, you can also compute what is called the light front wave function. It is the light front projection of the beta salpeter wave equation. And once you do that, then if you have this, then from there, you can compute what is your, uh, um, no, what is your PDA? Uh, it's not it's not beta salpeter amplitude. It's what is your pion distribution amplitude, and there is a, a in fact only an algebraic relationship between the light front wave function and the uh, and the PDA. So I will I will skip the details of this. Right? There is what is called uh, 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 this overlap representation of uh, of your GPDs. You can compute these GPDs in the in this model. You can calculate what uh, no you, you don't calculate it. Now what you do is that you use the information of your PDA, which you have already computed, and you are known more or less experimentally as well. You use that to construct your model, your spectral density, and from there you can compute your wave function, light from wave function. And once you have these light from wave function, which is a firm of X and, and K per square, then you can have this overlap representation to calculate your, your, your GPDs. And from there, if you have uh, uh, skewness equal to zero and also T, which is the Q squared momentum equal to zero, you can reproduce your PDFs. And you can also uh, uh, compute your uh, form factor. So I just want to see, say to you that when we calculate your PDFs, because we do it at the scale of 2 GeV, so we, we get the PDF uh, here, you can have it for the pion and for the kaon. And then you can use the DGLAP evolution equations, but then there are also things involved because DGLAP equations are perturbative evolution equations. And what we use is that we want to use a non-perturbative evolution scheme because we start from a momentum which is close to the hadron momentum, not the large momentum of 5-6 GVs where uh, experiments measure the PDFs. So what we use is this um, alpha, what we do is the running alpha that I was, I was showing you right in the beginning. So the results one evolved uh, to the scale where there are experimental measurements available are not so different from what we did. More than that, what I was pretty happy was, was uh, to try to uh, see that uh, what gets if we try to do the form factors, because we can also take from the same uh, light front wave function, we can calculate once we have the GPDs, we can also again come back to our form factor results. So, uh, so this is the algebraic model result. So a form factor for the k on is this using the model that we have built, and uh, and and uh, and this is the one for the pi on. Uh, this is this is uh, what is called. This is a band uh, that you can probably ah. Uh, this is the lower band because when you have just a model, you uh, give it a little bit of a variation which is allowed for different parameters that we use for the model. So, you know, within the limitations of this, the results that you've got is not so bad. What we want to try to see is just as a check, if we see how good we can get the G minus two contribution, how bad good it will not be, that will be a, a thing that we will do later. So the model is simple, but it has the correct power law behaviors, you know, put inside to, to calculate our observables. So we can extend this analysis of the algebraic model also to compute the pion electromagnetic form factor for large Q squared, pion and both K on. We can go to 30, 40 GV squared, which is a model because we can do the calculation. The full numerical computation will be hard and we're not in a, yet in a position to do that. But we can use the model. 
So uh, there is some group of Schrodinger-Eisen equations which uh, which suggests that their full calculation gives this results for the for the uh, for the fine form factor going up to forty GV square. This is uh, what the JLab will be doing the measurement in twenty two GV upgrade and will be going up to about eight GV uh, in, in this 12, uh, twelve GV upgrade that they have at the moment. So uh, our results for using the model, of course, it has a lot of uh, gap in it, but it is not so different from uh, this 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 earlier uh, prediction of this. So we are happy with the model that we have developed and see how far we can go in, 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 in computing different things. And I was uh, telling you that uh, that they are analyzing uh, now uh, in 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 JLab. The results that they uh, they uh, have got available for the k on form factor up to about about five GV squared. This is is the data being analyzed. These are the numbers, and uh, this was given to me by uh, Garth Huber. This this results, and when we try to do is with using our our model for the k on, uh, it's it's not so bad. It's it's this this is the band. This is the light blue band that we have for for the model that we have constructed. But uh, this is only a model that we have started building only two or three, three years ago. Uh, so we have not done much. We have just done the CPDs for the pion and the kaon. And um, what we have done is, is seeing different limits and what comes out. If uh, one of the things that we have recently also completed is, is uh, doing the same thing for eta and eta prime using, using this model. And the thing that we want to do especially is uh, to make the model better by using other basis of beta amplitudes of the pion and not just restricting itself to one, because we know that the others can have their contribution as well. So, 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 so we are working in, in different directions when we have complicated things to do so in the contact interaction model, when it's the intermediate complexity, the algebraic models, and then when there are simpler structures, then we can, we can do uh, the, you know, the, uh, try to use as many symmetries of QCD as possible. So I'm finally to my summary and outlook. The interplay of QCD akin truncations of Schrodinger Dyson equation and algebraic model based upon these studies shed important light on the internal structure of pion and KN in particular. And uh, then uh, uh, we have also uh, uh, contributed uh, towards the computation of pion and KN electromagnetic form at low and intermediate virtuality of the probing photon in electroproduction processes, especially the work. Uh, what we have done was with Angel Miramontes and Kepani Raya and Pablo Roch, and it's not so different from what uh, there's some earlier computation uh, in, in the field. And uh, there are results for the pion electromagnetic form factor, a large photon virtual accessible to the potential 20 dj upgrade, JLab, and EIC. They're also available. We have not done this, but there are groups, uh, uh, especially the first group, which is done using Schwing and Dyson equations. Um, more recently, what we have also done, and that is what we've done for the first time, but I haven't talked about, is computing these form factor in a time-like region where there are resonances present. There was it was never done before using a Dyson equation, and this is what Anthel Miramontes has been able to do. It he did his first work with Reinhard Alkofer in in University of of Graz, and and the Keon he studied when he's a postdoc postdoc So that's uh, uh, quite good. We have uh, uh, constructed uh, this algebraic model and which enables us the computation of the GPDs, PDFs, electromagnetic form factors with relative ease, which is reminiscent of contact interaction while still mimicking the reliability of QCD akin refined truncation of schwinger dyson equations. We have this uh, one work which is published on, on the GPDs and the, and the form factors. Um, okay, so despite these encouraging results and the synergy with experimental endeavors at JLab and EIC, a lot of improvements and extensions in the continuum QCD approach are desirable, desirable, and we are uh, aware of that and we are working on it. Deeper research into theoretical foundations of the truncations involved at the level of the green function of the fundamental degrees of freedom, that is quark gluons as well as quark gluon and gluon Gluon interactions also continues. I think Carol herself is working on, especially the ones gauges which are of interest are the light cone gauges. So she's studying the gap equation in the in the light cone light cone gauge, and we, we look for the results that she will produce. 
And then uh, Schwinger-Eisen equations have also been of substantial success in the studies of baryons, such as the transition form factors of nucleon to its excited state, which is a hallmark of class, class 12 and hopefully class 22 programs at JLab and hold the promise to offer a lot of reliable proof for future JLab and EIC era. Um, so I was telling you that one particular problem that at the moment I'm studying, uh, studying with a PhD student is this particular N going to N star 1520 transition form factor, which initial results are already there and uh, more refined uh, measurements will, uh, not the results are there of the calculation, but of the measurement. And there will be more measurements available soon. And, uh, uh, and uh, but, but this computation, we are already only doing it at the moment in the contact interaction model to see uh, uh, the details of how it all works. And thank you very much for your attention for six hours. Thank you, very much. Thank you for all your patience. Thank you for being here, yeah. <laughs> taking time. So let's open for questions. Uh, this like prescription is sort of geared for defining two dimensional densities from uh, integrals over GPDs. Um, I know that people like these definitions because it gives you like this Lorentz invariant notion of a density, but I don't know of any any methods of doing that for uh, connecting form factors to densities if it's not a charge density. If it's not a form factor that corresponds to a charge density, so as an example, I have studied uh, gravitational form factors, and that would that's like a really um, nice goal that we have is to develop a two dimensional interpretation um, because this bright frame Fourier transform is uh, not careful enough for other form factors. Um, so you have studied the gravitational form factor of ions, for example. Uh, what uh for scalar, oh, for scalar. scalar okay uh exactly. yes i think i actually didn't mention it so much i haven't done it myself but but the student who did phd with me he went to spain in fact and he uh is uh he is uh um, using this uh he's in fact used this algebraic model to try to uh study the um the gravitational form factor i think there are two form factors you studied one of those. The second one is a bit harder to compute. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think they they already have a paper in which they have computed one of these. But because I'm not involved with this calculation, I didn't even know the details mm -hmm. of this, so I didn't I didn't present it there. Okay. But if you're interested to see how we do it in our system, I can. Yes, you can. Perfect. More questions. Yeah. 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 Let's take this chance. It's the last lecture of Adnam. Yeah, so I was telling you, that, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was telling my fiance about the lectures and she had a question about the dynamic <laughs> mass generation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, so she's not here. No, she, she does a strong. But uh, I told her about the dynamic mass generation of the gluons in the IR. And she asked, would there ever be a reason to think that it goes away as you go even farther down. Are you generating a mass and then maybe as you go to smaller scales that well, smaller momentum. Is there any reason to think it there's there's a threshold and then it always has a mass? Okay. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting um, question to ask. But I was telling you that in in uh, you know about 20 years ago when people were who were studying uh, the gluon propagator going into the infrared and uh, 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 there were papers from two, three, four different groups. And there are, you know, below a certain scale, there are people who are saying it goes up, diverges, power law. They're saying, no, it goes down, goes to zero. They're saying, others saying, no, it goes, becomes flat. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then correspondingly, because the gluon propagator also feeds into the running coupling, they would say, okay, running coupling, does it diverge in QCD when you go to smaller momenta? Or it goes to zero, it becomes flat or not. Now, most of the people are converging to this idea that uh, all of these things become flat uh, in the infrared and they stay flat and the gluon propagator is like this, gluon mass is like this, and therefore the running coupling also becomes like this. Now, when we um, do the practical studies of, of, of hadrons, 
you know that a momentum scale becomes related to the distance scale. Um, and and when when you are doing the integration over the scales which involve the gluon propagator or the running coupling, uh, then you realize the following: that when you have very small uh, momentum, deep what we call the deep infrared, okay, then your measure of the integral is so small for the hadrons that we study that it almost never matters whether it is large or small or or it is flat it gives you it's only up till certain because the idea is something that be a very deep infrared mass scale which corresponds to very large distances okay. so um, if we had a hadron of the size of an orange or an apple it's somewhere there where what it ha what happens in the deep infrared becomes a real reflection of what happens in hadron, the hadron that we are studying. So we go below, I think, 0 0.01 or 0 0.02, where, where something like the size of the proton, neutron, and even the heaviest of nuclei are sufficient to go to. But uh, so I'm saying to you is that all the modern studies indicate that it doesn't happen, that it becomes flat. But if it's in the deep infrared region, it would probably, for the purpose of the hadron physics that we have in the laboratory, it doesn't even matter what, what it will be, what it will be like, it goes up or down. But most studies tell that it becomes, it becomes flat somehow, that QCD self regularizes. What is interesting is that when you have, in, in the other region, but when you have the large momentum, uh, then, uh, um, then you become your your massless perturbative gluon propagator. You, you recuperate, and that's what is important. That is not my work. I've never actually worked on this gluon mass generation, but I talked to the people who work there, a group in Brazil who works a lot in Spain. Uh, there are things which are a bit complicated because when a gauge boson acquires a mass, it somehow is violating your water densities. So does it do it or does it not do it? It's a, it's a subtle question. Some people, uh, there's a group in Belgium says that the BRST invariance is softly broken when when uh, uh, gluon acquires mass, but in a way that it still preserves the renormalizability of the theory. And also what you do is that this extra degree of freedom, would it mean that it has another polarization I mean, because massive gauge bosons should have three polarization instead of uh, two. So there are there are questions that the level of symmetry breaking or the scales or where would the scale come from uh, would uh, because most of these studies are only done in the in the Yang mill sector, the host and gluon. So there is a lambda QCD they're generating as well. Is it the same lambda QCD that we have in the quark sector because that doesn't communicate with this but still has a generation of mass? or it's the same scale which moves from one to the other. There are, there are lots of questions which honestly, uh, I, I don't understand myself so well, especially in the types of work that the gluon mass is involved. But I'm not involved in that. Yeah, but there are a lot of interesting things that have to be figured out. But uh, almost inevitably in these studies, the gluon requires mass. There, in fact, there is, it's called the Schwinger method. Schwinger had written an article saying that if you, I think it's a, it's in one of the articles, the statement is, if in the triple, uh, if in the gluon self interaction, you will have in the infrared a certain kind of singularity, then there is a likelihood that gluon can acquire mass in the infrared. I, I can't remember, you know, uh, um, Christina had written, shown it in, in, her, in her talk a few weeks ago. And in fact, they, there are latter results which show that that kind of singularity does uh, appear in the infrared for the triple gluon vertex. And, and therefore it's also an indication that maybe it does happen. So there are theoretical models which they put this singularity by hand, which is uh, seen in lattice results. So you can put there and then you see that gluon acquires mass and it is of the order of the 200 m. So that seem to be uh, emerging this phenomenon. Most of them have this flat result. It doesn't go up. Questions?
You can always bug him on Slack. Yeah, you can also bug him in Slack. Or go coffee, coffee to thing, his office. Anything. Come to my office. Yeah, or I can come sometimes here when you're having other classes and and uh, uh, we still have to work on the homework. Uh, 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 Alberto was telling me if there are people who are interested, uh, I, I will be around. Uh, I know that you guys are busy, but some of you might be staying for extra weeks here as well. And if you ever have time, we can always get together, say for half an hour in the afternoons or sometime. And if you want to see some of those homework, how they are done, uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to help. If I can't do it myself at that point, I can always refer to you where you can see it or, or come back to it the next day. Some of those are quite simple. Some of them may be a bit more tricky, but they are all doable and they may be helpful to you at some stage as well. And if you're interested, I mean, uh, definitely let us know. Uh, maybe maybe in the channel we will fill it out. The one possibility is the following uh, that we decide one day to be Tuesday next week, to be Thursday next week, and uh, or for both days. Uh, and then after the end of the lectures, after a suitable break, after that, we can come back here, maybe find a cooler and nicer room, I don't know, but we can come back. Only the people who want to do that yeah. will not be obligatory. Uh, but uh, so we can come back and we set up a little bit, we, maybe uh, Nan can recall what was that we wanted to, to do, what yes, was the yeah. homework, sure. a little quick context. And then, bang, we go in more groups, we discuss how to start, you know, in physics, we need to learn how to start a problem more than finishing it, because that then we do that yeah. along the way, right? So you start, and then after, I don't know, 10 minutes, uh, people going around, help, uh, you can help me, I may, I may be just missing what you're saying, I uh, give you this little feedback, mm -hmm. like that. But yeah. uh, 10, after 10 minutes, or five minutes, or whatever, uh, we come back and discuss together what is the idea, what is the idea, and, and then we take it from there, and something like this. So a little sure. bit in, in sure. a small group with, with quick feedback um, among everybody uh, who is yeah. there. Yes. And in fact, Carol has- And that it was of... very useful back at my time, like, because we watch all these lectures, but, you know, it's another thing when you really sit down and you try to make the calculation, looking at the definitions, and then all the questions they just arise out of nowhere, right? So yeah. sometimes we have this kind of practical doubts. And I found and that it was very this is <laughs> up Yes, and I have to apologize because I think some of you had asked me that I haven't put a helping material there uh, where you can see, um, because I haven't had time, I was preparing the, the lectures and the details, but I will, uh, give a reference to the books where you can see some of these uh, done a bit more explicitly, especially the perturbative calculation is from a from a from a review article, and I can I can give an indication of that, and I can also give there are some uh, uh, so, so some notes on on of other people or or books or even 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 I had I had given a, a set of lectures, and I think I have summarized. There are about 20, 30, 30 lectures that I somehow summarized in, in two or three uh, classes. And I can I can even, if you wanted, I could I could always put them uh, put them up and if you want to consult them. Hi, and there is a, uh, a sort of lecture which was recorded that was a lockdown uh, hugs for the key hugs. It's a lecture by Christina Aguilar. Oh. You mentioned the, uh, oh, yeah. I don't know, also probably just about even just most recently three minutes ago. Uh, this Christina and she gave her hugs lectures and these are re recorded. Yeah. So that, that that's another thing that you can try and, and I will I will actually she gave a very nice talk on gluon mass generation a few weeks ago. I can actually uh, I mean I'm sure she won't mind because it's in public domain. I can put those as well. You can see how the mechanism how what Schwinger talked about is what Cornwall's result was 1982 when we were the first one to suggest a gluon mass in the infrared of 350 MeV. And and how the Schwinger mechanism works to generate the mass for the blue and then it's 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 one of the very beautiful talks that I heard from her a few weeks ago that I worked myself on this with Lady Okay, if there is nothing else, don't go away because we need to talk about the tour tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>